Okay, so we're going to read the word of God from the Old Testament and from Job and chapter 23. Job replies to one of his uh, friends and says, Even today, my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy. In spite of my groaning, his hand forces God to me. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling, I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say. Would he oppose me with great power? No, he would not press charges against me. For there an upright man could present his case before him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. But if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he's at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I, I catch no glimpse of him. But he knows the way I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as God. My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. I have not departed from the command of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. Let's just finish the chapter. But he stands alone. And who can oppose him? He does whatever he pleases. He carries out his decrees against his decree against him. And many such plans he still has in store. That is why I am terrified before him. When I think of all this, I fear him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. Yet I am not silenced by the darkness, by the thick darkness that covers my face. So he reads the holy, infallible word of God. Amen. Well, in these last few days, we've had people in our midst who've, uh, um, in our congregation, who've gone down with COVID. We have people who've been sick and are carrying sicknesses and diseases and various things. We have have people who've had tests and perhaps are even now maybe waiting for uh, results from tests. We have people who are uh, awaiting to undergo treatment or maybe are undergoing treatments. And all these things, they bring suffering to us. And of course, suffering for the saint, the great suffering is not easy. It's not easy. Mentioned the devil, not to give him any glory, we mentioned it in prayer, but the devil uses suffering to try to bring his mist in, as it were, his mist or fog, if you want to call it that, to, to cover our minds, to cover the understanding of a believer. To hold the believer in doubt and fear. And to bring the question into the believer's mind. Does God really love you? How can God really love you if he's allowing this suffering to come upon you? And there's a sense in which Job is wrestling with that, isn't he? He isn't helped by his so-called friends, but he's wrestling with that right through the book. And, and just to read uh, those first couple of verses again, even today, he says, my complaint is bitter. My hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling, I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. Uh, you could say, in a sense, that part of Job's thinking is perhaps this, that have you done this? Have I done this? Perhaps this. What have I done to deserve being afflicted in this way? What have I done to deserve being made to suffer like this? 
Why me? Why me? Why me, oh God? Why me, oh God? And there's a sense, isn't there, that you can feel that sort of thought resonating as you read through the, the whole of the, the chapters of Job, as it were. Yes, he's attacked by his friends, and that raises another thing. He's going to try and show them that he's not the, the sinner that they think he is. He's still a sinner. We're all sinners. But he's not to the point that they're talking about. He's a righteous man in God's sight. He's got that to engage as well, hasn't he, from his so-called helpers. Where is God? Where is God? Where is God in my suffering? Where is he? He says, we've just read it. If only I knew where to find him in verse 3. In verse 8, if I go to the east, he's not there. If I go to the west, I don't find him. When he's at work in the north, I don't see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. The devil loves to bring those clouds. And our own minds kind of easily let those clouds blow in, as it were, to fog our minds, to confuse us, to forget his grace. For it's by grace that you are saved. Through faith. And it's not of yourself. It's the gift of God. It's by grace that we are saved, but somehow we get confused and the devil loves to try and confuse us with this. Then when we come into a time perhaps of suffering, other times as well, that we become fogged in our minds and we forget that it's all of grace. But I'm saved by grace. I'm justified by faith alone. In Christ alone, it's all the work of Christ. And we start to think, this has happened to me because I'm not good enough. It's because it's because of my sin. It's because I, I still wrestle with sin and I keep giving way to this particular temptation. That's why it's happened. God has rejected me. He's rejected me. It's by grace, isn't it? By grace. But the devil would keep that from your mind and let you think that somehow that God has brought this suffering to you because of your sin, because you're not good enough. And even many Christians who would be seeking to be kind and helpful to you, Job's friends here, are they truly believers? I don't know. Leave that for another time, perhaps. But even many Christians have a distorted understanding of suffering. How many times in the past have I heard it said to someone who's in the midst of suffering, God doesn't want this for you. It's not his plan. It's not his purpose for you. God doesn't want this for you. As so though somehow God is there saying, oh no. Oh no, if only I could do something to stop this from happening. Oh no, but the devil's too strong for me. He's brought it upon this person. God doesn't want this for you. The answer to that then is, well, why has it happened to me then? If God loves me and he doesn't want it for me, why is, why is he let it happen? As you know, Job isn't given a direct answer, is he? He's not given a direct answer to that question. If I uh, flip back to the, the first uh, chapter and verse 8, we read there that, we'll go to verse 6 of chapter 1, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going to and fro in it. He's not everywhere. He's not everywhere. If he's in one place, he can't be in another. Remember that. Remember that. It's only God who is everywhere present. Not the devil. Not the devil. Then the Lord said to Satan in verse 8, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. This hasn't happened to Job because of sin. This happened, hasn't happened to Job because he's not good enough, as it were, none of it. hasn't happened to him because of a particular sin. He hasn't been rejected by the Lord or any of those things. In the pain of suffering, 
wrestling with doubt and fear, effectively being attacked by his friends and assailed by the devil, who it was who has brought this suffering to him. Remember that. He's the one who's afflicted. He's the one who was used or was permitted, as it were, taking away the family, taking away Job's goods, bringing sores and pains and suffering to his body. The devil took him away. He's wrestling with doubt and fear. He's attacked. He's assailed. Yet here he is. He's a righteous man. He's a righteous man. And so we can say these three great things, that even the godliest suffer. Have you seen my servant Job? There's no one like him. Not right, righteous. No one like him. Have you seen my servant Job? Even the godliest suffer. So get rid of that foolish notion that I'm suffering because of this or that, because I'm not good enough. Even the godliest suffer. And then the second is that even the godliest struggle in suffering. Job's wrestling with this. He's wrestling with it. He's an upright, he's a righteous man. Can we put him in a, on a par with the apostle? Well, well, let's do that for a moment. Let's say he's as great a, a champion for truth as the apostle Paul. Wow. That's something, you know, the Apostle Paul feared, didn't he? I love reading it in Acts. It's in more than one place. The Lord comes to strengthen him. The Lord tells him not to fear. Paul would take on anyone. I thought it was like Paul. How oh, wouldn't I be fearless? No, Paul feared. Paul feared. Paul feared, man. He had to strengthen himself in the Lord to overcome that fear. He knew that in the Lord, there's nothing else uh, that is worthy of fear. And he could, uh, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, Bring himself to that level where he was fearless, as it were. He was a weak man like you, right? And he and Job, let's just put them for a moment, the two godliest men that's ever lived, let's just say that as a, as a statement, both of them. Even the godliest struggle in suffering. And then the third thing we can see, remembering Job, is that we're not always given all. The reasons. Job didn't know, did he? What had gone on? He didn't know uh, what had taken place with Satan and what the Lord had permitted him to do. He didn't know that. So it, we're not always given all the reasons. And I put an all in there because there can be several reasons. Sometimes, yes, the Lord might use suffering to, to discipline us and so forth. Of course, we'll come more to that perhaps in a while. But we're not always given all the reasons. So even the godliest suffer, even the godliest struggle in suffering, and even the godliest are not always given all the reasons. But we can say, we can say with conviction and with certainty, we can say this, that nothing in the Christian life is ever without reason. Nothing in the Christian life is ever without reason. And I'm going to quote it to you. You know the verse. We could almost all quote it together, couldn't we? All things work together for good for those who love God, who are the poor, according to his purpose. All things. God willing, next week we'll have our church library back up with a new shiny bookcase. If we can get the wheels on in front. <laughs> and in there we'll have a book. And that book will be called All Things for Good. And it's by a Puritan, Thomas Watson. And if you haven't read it, take it and read it. But just look at the head headings he gives. Because he says good things, bad things. And he says other bits in there as well. But, but effectively, he's just preaching on that text. But all things good and bad. All things work together for good. For God's people. Because God is the one who has the authority. God is the one who is sovereign over all things. Nothing happens in this world without the will of God, without the purpose of God, without the plan of God. There it is. Nothing takes place in the Christian life 
without reason. And I can say with confidence to you, every one of you, whether you're on the internet, whether you're here this morning, yes, God is sovereign and he has a plan and a purpose for you in every single situation. Even missing the train, as some I was told did this morning. <laughs> He has a plan and a purpose for you in every situation. Especially in suffering. And we can go further and we can say, we can give, we can see in scripture, we can probably see more, but I'm going to focus with two. We can say that there are two reasons, two reasons when it comes to suffering. There are two reasons that apply to every suffering, to the suffering of every saint. Two reasons, I've done one. Two reasons that apply to the suffering of every saint. We'll focus on one this morning, and God willing, we'll focus on the second one uh, next summer. Two reasons that apply to the suffering in every saint. Not always given all the reasons, but there's two I can give you. There's one. And we turn in Job to chapter 23 and verse 10. And we read there, he knows the way that I take. When he's tested me, I shall come forth as gold. You know, the apostle Paul, I've already linked us with him, with Job. He says, oh, when we came into Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest. We were harassed with every turn. Conflicts on the outside, fears within, fears within. That's Job, isn't it? Conflicts on the outside. He's lost everything, as it were, with his material wealth. He's lost loved ones and so forth. And his own body on the outward, as it were, has been uh, smitten with sores and all manner of things. And within, therefore, he's suffering as well, isn't he? Just like the Apostle Paul there. That's Job. That's Job. Man who is facing and is in the midst of intense suffering. And yet, his faith, his faith held. He read some of the uh, questioning, some of the uncertainty in those opening verses, but his faith held because he says, but, but, he knows the way I take. When he's tested me, I shall come forth as God. And that gives us one of the reasons for the suffering of the saint. It's part of God's refining. Always. It's part of God's refining. It's not necessarily we're talking about it's because you're a student or anything. Like that. No, get away from it. It's part of God's refining. He uses our difficulties for the triumph of his glory. He uses our difficulties, as it were, to refine us. And we'll come to more of that in a while. Part of God's refining. We see behind the scenes what Job doesn't see. Or we see this dialogue, and we, we sort of still can't understand it, how the Lord would permit and, and would speak with a, a fallen devil, as it were, one whom he's cast down. But that's another story again, isn't it, which we're not going to enter into this morning to try and uncover that. But we see behind the scenes and we see this dialogue. And we see that the devil says, he's only righteous, this Job, because you've blessed him. Take those things away and you'll see him curse you then. Oh, he's only righteous uh, because uh, his own body's all right. Yeah, he doesn't really care about anyone else. He's not really bothered about the two of you. You'll harm his body and ah, then you'll see him. He'll curse you to your face. That's uh, what the devil says, isn't it? We see behind the scenes and we see all that. And so when someone says, and they mean well, God doesn't want this for you. God doesn't want this for you. The Lord allowed it to happen. He allowed it to happen to Job, didn't he? He allowed it to happen. It was part of his permissible will. And that's not to say, don't ever think for one moment that God is some kind of tyrant who gets some kind of pleasure out of afflicting his people. Rubbish. Don't even ever go down that route. That's, that's the devil's mist coming in, as it were. Try and confuse you. 
And we don't want to take up our time this morning trying to uh, destroy that myth and that lie. Leave that aside. Let's get to the good things because these are the things we, we need to focus on. What we see, what we can see in the word of God, Job believed by faith. Job didn't see the devil speaking with the Lord or anything like that, but he believed by faith that though all these things were happening to him, God knows the way that I take. He believed by faith. And he believed by faith that these things were part of God's refining when he has tested me. And he believed by faith that it wouldn't destroy him because he said, I shall come forth as God. Hallelujah. I shall come forth as God. So, Job believed by faith, firstly, that the Lord knows. The Lord knows. I've been to a certain football stadium and a former manager there, who everyone connected with the club thought was great, had his name written up and he said that he knows. He knows. Just said his name and he knows. He knows. As though somehow uh, this mere man was uh, omniscient that he knew all things. Rubbish. The Lord alone knows. He knows everything, doesn't he? And we must get rid of any foolish notion, cloud of the devil, the mist of the devil, to, to think that in some way he, he doesn't care about you because you're coming into a time of suffering or you've been in a lifetime of suffering. Perhaps. Must get rid of the foolish notion uh, that he's not there for you, that he's left you, that he's forsaken you, that he's rejected you. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Whether you've got many or few, they're all numbered. And it's not talking about, you know, it's easier for him with that person because he's only got, he's got a full head. So it's easy for him to know he's done with that, doesn't it? It's just, uh, um, it's a word hyperbolic, and I use it in this context, but it, it's there to, to show us. He knows everything. Who can count your very hairs in your head? He doesn't need to, because he knows. He knows. The Lord knows. And he knows your heart. And he knows the very thoughts of your heart. And he knows your voice. We perhaps detect a person's voice when they say hello on the phone. He knows before you say hello. He knows the things you're going to say. He knows your thoughts in advance. He knows your words in advance. He knows your actions. He knows what you're going to do. He knows what's going to happen to you. And he's in control of it, isn't he? In control of all of it. You know very well the Psalm 139. You know very well these verses. Let me just read them to you. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit. And when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my thoughts. Before a word of the tongue, you know it completely. Oh Lord. And then if you're there in Psalm 139, look at verse 8. If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I set on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. It's got you, hasn't it? You've got a hold of it. Underneath are the everlasting arms. The eternal God has spoken down the right way. The eternal God is thy refuge. Underneath are the everlasting arms. And it's not just that he sees. It's that he cares and that he, he has. You know, there was the Israelites. Let me read this to you from Exodus. There were the Israelites. And at first it was great. It was almost like the land of plenty, wasn't it? Going to Egypt, as it were. It certainly got them away from a place of starvation and so forth. But they were there many generations. And then towards the end of it, of course, things turned nasty for them. All prophesied by the Lord. All permitted by the Lord, 
all part of the Lord's will and purpose for them. But then you read this, so let me read it to you. If you wanted to find it, it's Exodus 2, and it's right at the very end, 23. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham with Isaac and with Jacob, putting our understanding so that we can follow it. But basically, it wasn't that he, they, if they'd not cried out, he wouldn't have been aware. Of course, he saw, he understood. But they came to that point where they were crying out to him. So it's now bringing to our minds that he's going to act. And so God, you look at the next verse, God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. He was concerned and he was going to act. What was he going to do? And raise up Moses. Very next chapter, chapter three, he begins to raise up Moses for that very purpose, for that very task, to deliver his people from slavery and bring them into that land flowing with milk and with honey. He doesn't just care, he acts. Now, last recently, before I went on holiday, is there work in heaven? Is heaven a place of work or is it a place of rest? It's actually a place of work, isn't it? It's a place of work because Christ is there at the right hand of the Father, working. He's interceding. He's interceding for the saints at the right hand of the Father, even now. Even now. And the Father is working. The Father is working because he's commanding the angels. He's saying to this one, go to that person there. Go to those people here. And the angels of heaven, who would otherwise be saying, holy, holy, come are being sent into this world to minister to the suffering church. To come to each one of his people at the point of need. So there's work going on, isn't there? There's work going on in the world. And for you and I, when we enter into suffering, and as a theologian once said, uh, not in my ear, ear, but in my eye, as it were, and it stuck with me. If you live long enough, you will suffer. You will suffer. It's a fact. It's a fact. Some begin suffering, and we're not talking about falling over and cutting your knee. Some begin suffering a lot earlier than others, and some have a lifetime even of suffering. But all of us will experience it. All of us will experience it. And suffering begins a journey. And Job's friends come to him because they don't believe that anyone should suffer alone. They go about it the wrong way, yes. But they don't believe that anyone should suffer alone. And they shouldn't suffer alone. Nor should the Christian suffer alone. Because the Christian is part of one body. Part of the church of Christ, the living Lord Jesus Christ. Your hands and arms, don't you? Eyes and ears, and you can read 1 Corinthians 12 to speak on gifts and so forth. But, but what are they there for? So that, oh, look at me, I've got the gift of this. Oh, isn't he great? Clapping? Nonsense. There to help one another, not to edify and glorify the, 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 the fool, if he's thinking in that way, the one who's gone back there for the common good, for the building up of the body. Read Ephesians 4 and, and you, you get the same idea, the same thing. We're part of one body. Let me just uh, read you. Let me read you this. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. The body is a unit. It is made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. I mean, I could read the whole, but let me just read 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Here we're thinking of suffering. If one part suffers, every part suffers. Every part suffers. And the best way I can describe it is again from something I read. It was William Carey, the father of the modern, modern, modern missionary, the modern missionary movement, that's what I'm trying to say. The father of the modern missionary movement, Carey. 
He'd been in India some years and he's been wrestling in working, translating uh, the Bible, the New Testament, Old Testament into Indian languages and so forth, but many of them. And he's been witnessing and trying to establish a church. And the first uh, kind of converts are, are beginning, things are beginning to happen. And there's a lady and she's converted. But the conversion for her means suffering, means beatings from her husband, means people are attacking her, ostracizing her, want to end her life. And she comes along the road and she's crying and she meets care. And what does he do? She tells him, she pours out her heart to him and he sits down on the ground with her and he weeps with her. He weeps with her. That's the church, isn't it, in action. One part suffers. The whole suffers. You're suffering. Don't ever think that you suffer alone because the church is united with you. Wants to be with you, wants to support and help, and by the grace of God, will support and help. But even above and beyond that, what do those angels do? Work in heaven. Go, says the Father. Go now to this one immediately. Come and comfort that son. Still, he says, No. I will go myself. For I dwell in the heart of every believer, but I will show myself as it were. I will manifest my glory in that person. I will give them such a glorious sense of my reality that the suffering will be forgotten. God does all these things. It's all these things. The Christian doesn't, mustn't suffer alone. And then in verses eight to ten here in Job, we have again this going to the east, going to the west, going to the north, going to the south. But then say, he knows the way I take. He knows the way I take. Faith, it's been often said, faith trusts where it can't trace. Fully, faith Trust him where it can't trace him. Can't see his presence as it were. Can't feel his presence. Can't even sense his presence in this situation. It seems so dark. And yet, faith grabs hold of the glorious truth. I will never leave you. Nor forsake you. It's what faith is. Last song of that, you know, and I love to say this, it's written in the Old Testament and it's repeated in the New. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So often the Lord writes things twice, doesn't he? A, to confirm it, but B, because we're slow, we're dull, aren't we? We're, we're quick to listen to the devil and let the clouds of mist come in as it were. So he repeats it. Never will I leave you. There it is. Glorious truth. And faith grasps hold of that. We do. We do that. Maybe you're not experiencing great suffering this time. Maybe you are. You do. And you grasp in hold of that truth. He will never leave you, nor forsake you. And when you don't feel the sense of his presence, we don't experience uh, that sense of his presence. Faith must say, because here come the mist cloud, faith must say, well, stay your hand, stay your hand. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. And I'm not for sin. I'm precious to the Lord. I'm precious to him. Do you know how much you're worth? Do you know how many coins you're worth? Well, Process, isn't it? The blood of Christ is priceless. Right. But here's a faith. Here's a faith. Here's a fact. Here's a fact, says faith. You know, say faith must trust him where it can't trace him. Here's a fact. Faith actually can say, well, actually, I can trace him. I can trace him. Always. I can trace him. And especially in the deepest grief. In the deepest bitterness, in the lowest, or at the lowest point of suffering, I can trace him. 
I know he's there. What? Jesus loves me. Yes, I am. Tells me so. Believes. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he proves it. He proves it. No one experienced suffering his suffering. And so your faith and mine can say, for me, for me, is why Jesus suffered. He suffered for me. He bled for me. He came into this world for me. Let's go to the start. He came into this world for me. He lived a perfect life for me. He suffered for me. He went to the cross for me. He died for me. So that I could be forgiven. So that I no longer need suffer for my sin. Because you know, even if there's a dear saint and they suffer, uh, some kind of illness, whatever it might be, for a whole lifetime. Life is short. Life is short. E eternity is forever. And if there's someone who isn't the saint, however they suffer much in this life, physically, mentally, or not, if they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, they will suffer for their sin. That is hard. But can you imagine the worst kind of uh, suffering you could experience in this life? It's nothing in comparison to having to answer and pay your own price for your sins. No gold is enough. It's an infinite God whom you believe. It's an infinite God who must be justified. And therefore, who's so So please. Things for, if you're a saint, to, to keep at the back of your mind and to, to remember then for, for praying for those who don't know them, that this will be, oh, I've got a great life now, everything's so wonderful. I've got this and I've got that in my life. I'm shining like a, a star in the in the world, as it were. I'll be gone. And then what do you have? Then will come like that rich man with Lazarus. Then will come your sores. Then will come your sickness. And then will come your, oh, if only, if only I could have a, just a tip of his tongue, a tip of his finger on my tip of my tongue, is it? No hope for saying to keep that in. But, but for us, for us, faith says, Jesus Christ died for me so that I no longer need to suffer for sin. And all, yes, all, how dare you say that, you see? There's so and so going through this kind of suffering, but I say it all other suffering, be it ever so great, is not at the well, not at the depth of suffering for sin, for sure, and is temporary, is passing. And so, therefore, if Christ has died for me, so I no need longer suffer for sin, all lesser suffering. Faith can say, carry me through. And here's the thing, and perhaps, perhaps here, maybe let's take a run up to this and perhaps let's end it here before we come to consider the, the testing, and which was really the whole purpose of the Lord refined. We haven't got to that. Uh, but let's maybe leave that for another time and let's just take a run at what I want to say in this. But here we have one. In verse 10, who says about his own testing and says he shall come forth as God when he's tested me. Who, who is, of whom can we say that could also apply? Oh, well, it can say it applies to every one of us. Yes, it does. But who does it apply to in the utmost sense? Of whom can it be said that that applies to where it mattered for the whole world? That's the Lord Jesus, isn't it? And the Lord Jesus was made perfect through suffering. The Lord Jesus was tested, as it were, was allowed to be tempted by the devil and was tested in every way. And yet he did not sin. He was made perfect 
through suffering. And actually, he didn't say that. Didn't he? There's another one that a, opens up an avenue, but we can't go down there because it's all well, up there because it, it would take too long to, to kind of expand on those things. But just get that that he was made perfect through suffering. He was tested and he came through that. How did he come forth? He came forth as God. He came forth as God. And therefore, if I belong to him, I become his God. He becomes gold in me, as it were. And I'm jumping and stretching and, and not now applying this testing to us because that for time's sake, I'll leave it there. But, but just, just in this, that Christ has been tested in every way for us. And therefore, what he's achieved, what he's accomplished, what he's done is perfection. And he can lay it to us and say, there you are. Not, not follow my path, I've shown you the way. See if you can do it. No, it does work, you know, like someone might do that. But no, 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 I can give that to you. I can apply that to you. It belongs to you. My perfect life, my perfect life of testing is now yours. God will look at you and see me in. He will look at you and your life. And it's as though in God's mind, we haven't put with the Father, not as none of that. It was his plan and purpose. It's as though the Father looks on and says, you, my child, you belong to Jesus. He's done it for you. And it's as though you and I have done it for ourselves. That's how tremendous it is. <laughs> Glorious. But you've been tested in every way. And he's come forth as God. And so God looks on us, who were wretches, who were vile and full of sin, as though we had no sin. Indeed, we don't have any sin. Because it's been cancelled. It's been nailed to the cross. Christ has borne it all. He's paid the price. He's gone. Gone. No suffering for sin remains. Yes, there's discipline. Yes, there's refining. More than that, God willing, another time. But there's no more punishment for sin for the saint, for any who believe. And so here it is. That Christ has suffered in a way that no one else ever shall. And that if I am his, then God looks on me as the God that is depicted here, as it were, as pure God because of Christ. But then to say this, that, oh, in the midst of suffering, or the pain of suffering, even the mental torment of suffering, whatever it might be. That those who suffer most there's evidence to suggest. Can we say this of the Lord? Does the Lord show favoritism? No, he doesn't. But there's a sense in which from our perspective, we can look on it, but if I'm a saint and I'm suffering more than other saints, I've got more evidence of the love of God for me than they have. That's incredible, isn't it? It's incredible. Because the Lord refines, the Lord disciplines those he loves. The Lord cares for them in that way. And we say, no, 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 that can't be the right way. That's not the way the world does it. It's through the fire. Yes, it's through the waters, but the waters won't overwhelm you and the fires will not burn you up because he will go through there with you. And the final line is this, that those who therefore suffer most, experience most, the Lord's comfort. Amen.